Welcome to the second Sound Studies Institute lecture of the new academic term. We're coming to you from Amiskwachi, West Cahagan, uh, sometimes known as Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, we're in Treaty 6 territory, the traditional homeland of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many other Indigenous people. Uh, sound and music have been heard, has been heard. Uh, created, celebrated here for thousands of years by many diverse First Nations. And tonight we want to humbly add uh, our sounds to this history with respect and solidarity. So uh, if this is your first time uh, to one of these lectures, I'll just uh, SSI um, is, a sound, is the Sound Studies Institute at the University of Alberta. We're a research institute that celebrates and supports research into sound uh, from all angles, from performative and artistic understandings of sound, uh, to um, other human and non-human understandings of the role of sound in our world. So tonight, uh, we're really excited to, uh, uh, to present really an update on an important archiving project that <coughs> SSI has been involved in uh, for a few years now, uh, Resounding Cultural Voices, Digitizing the Ancestors Project, uh, and that will be presented this evening by Bert Crowfoot uh, and Mary Ingram. Uh, the project brings full circle the sounds of long silent audio um, archival radio and television recordings from the late 1960s and the early 1980s, um, resounding the voices, stories, music, and dances of Indigenous elders, culture bearers, and youth that speak of urgent cultural revitalization and resurgence. The presentation will share voices from the AMSA archive, that's the Aboriginal Multimedia Society of Alberta, that have uh, resonated in the decades since they were first heard through stories and interviews and performances of music and dance that reflect important social and political and cultural issues of their time. These are the voices of Cree nations across the Canadian prairies. They sing, drum, dance, and speak of residential school restrictions on cultural expression and share stories of round dances, drumming circles, and singing the land. Uh, they talk of healing through music, rhythm, and words and the need to educate uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. Uh, in resounding their voices for new listeners, their messages are returned to the community and listened to uh, with echoes of contemporary society. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear about this project. Um, uh, I'll just uh, introduce our speakers. Bert Crowfoot is a Siksika Salto digital storyteller. He's renowned as a community leader and accomplished photographer, journalist, TV producer, businessman, and pioneer in Aboriginal communications and media across North America. He's the founder and CEO of AMSA and the lead in, digi in the Digitizing Ancestors Project. Um, Bert is the great-great-great-grandson -grand, uh, great of legendary Blackfoot uh, Chief Crowfoot. Uh, Mary Ingram is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts in St. Mary's University, Nova Scotia, which she's just uprooted herself across, the, across Canada to take this new position, and I'm excited for her. Uh, she is an interdisciplinary scholar whose recent collaborative projects explore social and political perspectives and influence on the creation of performances uh, of music, performance of music and sound in Canada. Uh, and across arts practices, genres, and cultural communities. And before I turn it over to them, I also want to just give a quick shout out to a couple other people. Ben Tucker, uh, who is also a co-investigator in this project um, and served as the director of SSI before <coughs> I took the reins in the summer of 2020. And during that summer, which as you all remember, <laughs> was our tumultuous beginnings into the lockdowns, um, ben really worked tirelessly to ensure that the, um, that the project uh, was able to continue despite the lockdowns uh, and we were able to keep the project on track. So I um, just want to, and I think he's here tonight too. Um, and additionally, I want to acknowledge Tom Merklinger, whose precise technical work um, in digitizing multiple formats of videotapes and films, uh, and he who has worked also worked tirelessly through the pandemic to keep this important heritage project moving forward. So, uh, and without further ado, I will now turn it over to Bert and Mary. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, a little bit about this project and how it first started. Um, I started in media in 1977. I was started off as a freelance photographer, uh, sports reporter, uh, started full-time in November of 1977, 
and um, I was at the Alberta Native Communication Society Native People newspaper. It went under in 1982, and we started a new organization with most of the staff called Aboriginal Multimedia Society. About three or four years later, the uh, federal provincial government came to us and said that they had all these archives that were in receivership and they didn't want it to just be lost. So they asked us if we were willing to, uh, to take um, uh, control or to, to look after these archives. And I, I said, of course, uh, I'd love to. And uh, when the story first broke a couple of years ago, uh, you know, the headline was, we got it for a buck. And, <laughs> and how that happened was the provincial government paid the thousands of dollars for the archives, and we paid a dollar to transfer it over to AMSA from the provincial government for the receiver. So that's how that story went. But, uh, and it sat in our, in our storage uh, warehouse for years, literally years. And then uh, Noel McNaughton, who's been one of our lifelong board members, uh, was at a meeting at the University of Alberta and started talking to Mary. And they, he told her about these archives. And, you know, of course, Mary was very interested. And he uh, put us in touch with each other. And, and, and like I said, the rest is history. We started on this project. We worked at securing funding from various sources, from the university, from federal government. Uh, <coughs> and so even our bingo revenues were involved. And uh, we started with all of the audio tapes. We had boxes and boxes of it. And the, the first step of it was to um, catalog. I'm sorry, I got a little <coughs> itch in my throat. I just had some supper here a couple of minutes ago. But um, so we, we got this project going and the first thing to do was to catalog it, like what's in these boxes. And literally these boxes had been moved about three times. So they were just put on shelves and we didn't know what was what, who was where. And so we had a couple of students go through it and start cataloging it. And once that was finished uh, and then uh, the project began with the digitization of all of the audio tapes that we had, cassettes, reel to reels and has now progressed to where we're starting to transfer digital uh, video, uh, film, etc. Uh, the thing, the problem with the video is that the audio is separate from the, the visual uh, tapes. So we've digitized everything and now the guys at the university have, have are, are working at trying to match the, the, uh, the audio with the visual stuff. So that's that's kind of where we're at right now. Mary, do you want to? Yeah, sure. I should first acknowledge, since I'm no longer in Alberta, I should acknowledge first that uh, uh, St. Mary's University is located in Mi'kmaq, which is ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, so I'm uh, respectfully acknowledge the people and, and ancestors, pres uh, past, present, and future, as well as all of the uh, uh, communities in Alberta with, with which and in which we work. So very excited to be here. Um, and uh, Scott read the abstract. So there's a whole lot of what we are, the reasons behind why we're, we're doing what we're doing uh, were explained in that. Um, the archive has just a wide variety of uh, content so in addition to contemporary events and current affairs type programming and news stories, there's powwow events, there's interviews with elders, politicians, artists, there's storytelling, there's singing, there's video of, uh, of dancing and other kinds of performances and, and uh, lectures and teachings and intergenerational learning and education, as well as I think Bert, there's, there's fictional television, right? Is also part of some of the video archives. So it's a very rich archive. And um, the audio uh, presented a great deal of this richness to us, but it's when we get into the video and we start uh, learning more about the individuals and the communities around which a lot of this was um, uh, created in these stories told, uh, is that we really understand the uh, can understand the value of this incredible archive. So I love working with Bert on this. There's not enough time or money uh, or human resources to uh, to do everything we want to do. So uh, we're happy, you know, to give this to give this update to show you a few clips 
from a variety of, uh, of um, excerpts from the archive. Of course, we only have an hour, so it's not going to be a lot. Um, but I will say what's very interesting to me, uh, one of the main points interesting to me is the stories that were told in the 60s and 70s are the stories that are still being told. And uh, two things, there's great learning in that for those of us who weren't part of the stories originally, but also um, the value of the narrative and uh, to, to ongoing learning and teaching. So the, uh, the events, the stories, the, the, the content, in some cases, the individuals are very much alive. I think Bert said that already, very much alive and very much part of uh, contemporary culture, even though this stuff is as old as I am. And, and and almost as old as Bert is. So um, it's, there's a great echoes, great resonance, great, uh, you know, all kinds of sound language there. Yeah. Yeah. But, so uh, I was going to say that uh, these are media archives. Okay. They're not, they're not archives that of, of ceremonies or of culturally, they are of cultural events, but more from a news perspective as opposed to a, a, uh, a um, as a uh, person who's in the cultural realm and so, or the spiritual realm. So uh, most of these have already been aired on radio or television or in newspapers. So um, there was a, uh, we did, or Mary did run uh, a lot of the content through some cultural advisors. And there was some questions about the, uh, individuals who had passed away and you know can can you listen to their voices and we ran it by their families and uh john snow we only had the video we didn't have the audio for john snow but i ran it by his family and they just loved it to actually see their father grandfather talking i mean you have to read lips to understand what he was saying but he he was talking and for them to see it was a very uh powerful uh, emotional experience for them and also other people who have have uh, who have passed away but their voices and the message that they have is still very relevant in in today's world so uh, just uh, like I said I'm almost as old as Mary and I uh, uh, <laughs> I'm well preserved and so uh, to see people like Dr. Ann Anderson you know uh, uh, to to see some of these other individuals. We'll listen to Eva Cardinal tonight. Uh, when we applied for our licenses for the Edmonton and Calgary radio stations, we ran some of these clips and we had Dr. Ann Anderson telling a story about the bear and, and picking berries. And, and, you know, it was very, uh, it was like listening to Kukum, her grandmother, and the stuff that she had to say. You just sit there, you're mesmerized by her voice. And, and then she went back and forth from Cree to English so that whoever was listening could understand whether you're a speaker or a non-speaker, uh, which is what we do with our radio stations today is we, we do a lot of our programming that is bilingual. So people that are non-speakers or non-Indigenous can understand and, and, and enjoy and, and listen to the stories that our people have to tell. So getting back to these archives, it's been a, it's been a, a, a great trip. Um, I mean, the guys at the university have worked their tails off to uh, to make sure this stuff happens. And I'm very appreciative and grateful to them for the work that they've done. Excellent. So what, what we've got here is I've, we've selected a variety of types of clips. So uh, some talking, some video, some some different kinds of content, uh, and just excerpts. That's sort of all we can do. We're already 20 minutes in, so just excerpts of uh, aspects. And so what I will do is I'll sort of flip through the slides just to get to the content, because we've given a lot of the, the um, advanced information first, um, sort of set it up, and then and then have... have uh, um, Bert add anything that he wants to it and when I get to a couple of the videos Bert will provide the context for it and uh, and we'll watch some of these shorter two three four minute videos uh, for information and uh, Bert if anything along the way you decide you don't want us to play you just say so and I'll click to the next one okay <laughs> okay. okay so I'm going to share the screen and so I won't be able to see any, re any Bert's reaction here so Bert is just going to interrupt me um, if uh, if you want something different, 
uh, and um, see that, make sure I can get do this. Share sound. All right, can you see that? Yes. Okay, all right. Well, let's see what, what we got here. Unfortunately, it's not letting me advance the screen. What's going on there? There we go. Okay, so the first one is uh, uh, just an example of some of the knowledge transfer. This is one about particularly about song and dance, and it's an interview with Eugene Alexis. Uh, not sure what we think it's 1998. Actually, it's a later one, and uh, about his experiences with powwow and round dance, drumming and performance, and he describes the influence of his father and other mentors. So I'll play the first clip. It's just a minute and uh, uh, a little a little over a minute as soon as I find it here. That's one. Let's start there. Uh, who makes them? The songs are mostly uh, passed on from my dad. Um, when my dad was uh, teaching us, he did such a good job that when he taught me how to round dance, he trained me to watch out for uh, music. He trained me to read music and to hear music. And the the chanting, the the humming. There's there's certain tones. There's a high pitch, a low pitch. There's all types of hooks that he taught us to use. And during those times, he also taught me a little bit on making songs. And since my late father has passed on, I have been the song maker of our drum group. Aside from my sister Daphne Alexis in Calgary and uh, my brother Arnold. Oops. Okay. My so, Bert, can you tell us uh, anything more about? about this, about this kind of teaching and? Um, not really. Um, I know Eugene, uh, he's a, a really good friend from Alexis. And so uh, it's it's also, like I said, a, a learning experience for me tonight because this is the first time I've seen this or heard this. Okay, okay. Yeah, there's lots of, lots of uh, examples of this kind of conversation. Uh, individuals telling how they how they learned, who they learned from, and and how it uh, influenced their own their own work. So here, these two videos. These are two of Bert's of Bert's videos. One with uh, with Alan Paired. So, do you want to set this one up, uh, Bert? The first one. Yeah, we um, uh, entered into television for the first time, and what we did was a television pilot for Omni Television. And it was a four-part, 30-minute uh, series uh, where we, it was called Quest for Buffalo Spirit. And what we did was we interviewed elders uh, from uh, uh, Qualicum Beach, from the Kwakwako people. Uh, Alan Pard is actually uh, a spiritual leader, medicine person from Pikani, from Southern Alberta. And he's since passed on about a few years ago. And also, um, we interviewed uh, uh, Mary uh, Thomas from uh, the uh, uh, Shushwap yeah, Nation. Shushwap, but it's, I was trying to think of her first nation. Nisconwith. Nisconwith. And so, um, some beautiful uh, interviews with them and uh because it was with Omni, Omni is a multicultural uh, broadcaster. We had to version it into something else. So we also have some clips of me speaking Mandarin on the banks of the Bow River on, at Siksika. And uh, it's, it's kind of funny to, you know, when because I told people I know how to speak Chinese and I play that clip and they just look at me with eyes wide open. And I'm kind of lying a little bit there. But um, um, but that's one of the, the, the things that we got out of this for... Uh, thirty minute one, and most of the elders in in that television project have have passed on now. So it was very important. And I don't know if this is the one that you're talking about, but uh, Alan Pard, um, what I'm doing with this is I'm presenting him with protocol blankets, tobacco, 
And what he did was he transferred uh, a uh, iniscum, which is a, um, a buffalo stone. And he also uh, uh, transferred a Blackfoot name to me, uh, Gaia Stoyo, which is bear ghost. And then he also talked about the importance of recording these ceremonies. Because of residential schools, a lot of individuals were uh, told, no, you can't record. You're not supposed to record ceremony. You're not supposed to do this. And it's mainly because if the priests or nuns found out you were, a, a, you know, a beaten or, or even worse, as you, as you know, from the, relevant, uh, the stories that are, uh, are coming out in the news right now. And so, um, but Alan said, look, it's, I'm really impressed with what you're doing and, and your recording of these ceremonies so that they can be preserved for future generations. And in fact, his words and some of the, the other um, elders uh, are passing on their knowledge from, from the other side. So, so yeah, there's two uh, one and a half minute clips here, one talking about the recording and then the second one. And on the next page, I actually have the clip speaking with elders and that's with uh, Adam Dick and Mary Thomas. And I think Ruth Brass is in that one. Yep. So, yeah, so, so I can play the three of them in succession since you've talked about them. Let's uh, start with the Tikani. Yeah. Very impressed with your... Uh ambition to, uh, to start filming, to start doing what, what you're doing. Uh, we don't do enough of this. And, uh, I think this is part of those adjustments I'm saying we need to, if we need to move forward, then we've got to make these kind of changes. Uh, I know our people, our ancestors, were totally against recording our history, but Yet, then again, for some anthropologists, they really recorded and uh, documented some really significant parts of our, our culture. And I'm not going to compete with my elders that were born 100 years ago, because they did it. But I think it's important that we, we get to start uh, documenting and preserving our culture. And I'm really impressed with your attempt at that. Uh, Maybe not specifically recording or documenting the, the culture per se, but the messaging. The important thing about messaging is uh, the dilemma we're, we're in and how we should start making change. I think that's quite significant. And I'm, I'm hoping we can do this with this, with this uh, interview that we're having today. And it's just like your production. So. We're all Indian people here today, and you know it's gonna it's gonna happen. It's gonna be happening from our perspective, us telling and us messaging messaging our own people and mainstream and by our ways. Blowing in from every direction. Uh, that's a kind of a, a sign that. There's going to be a battle or confrontation soon, and so it's kind of a, a heads up to get ready for, for a situation like that. And then uh, anytime we're doing some kind of a ceremonial function or some kind of event and there's lots of wind, it's because we're entering into controversial matters. And so... so Probably what we're doing, you know, today is is going to be controversial, you know, so uh, it's kind of a heads up for all of us to, to be prepared for entering controversy. What you guys are doing is you're spearheading and pioneering to uh, some of the recordings that maybe some people are still very reluctant and, and view this as, as you know, a serious breach. But I, I see it as only the only way to reach out to our people to, to give for messaging. And uh, recording and documenting our ways, we have no alternative but to start doing it this way. And so next we have the, um, the uh, speaking with elders with... Uh, Going Sorry. Very impressed from every direction. There we are. 
with uh, the one Bert mentioned a minute ago. What's different about, I think, Aboriginal culture up and down this coast and throughout North yeah. America is those connections to the spirit world to talk about why we did the food gathering in those specific manners. And it's that living memory that we're desperate to maintain and to record and remember. Hey, 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 hey. They, they lost. They, they don't know who they are now. They don't know what clan they belong to. And what the, the, the problem is, is they, they just what we call long hands, long arms. You know, they'll reach into other people's box and they, and they go and play with it. And it's not just enough to record this. It's not just enough for young directors and filmmakers to make these uh, films uh, like their family albums. There, there's a real need for all of the protocol rules to be used in those times. And so it's difficult for us to find people who actually will observe those rules. Oh, oh, oh. Our culture is transmitted in two ways, material and non-material. The material you have, like the carvings, the basket make and canoes, drums, anything's made with the hands. Non-material, number one, is our language, our spirituality, our songs, our dances, our laws, traditional laws. And our people are struggling. So few elders are willing to share or even have the knowledge. So few are left. And sometimes we as elders are afraid to. I know I'm always full of fear. That's why I'm not pushing myself on anybody. I'll only share when I know they're ready for it. In English, I don't know, but in Blackfoot, this is his turn not to his. Can you up out to come up? Up those were his teepees. And then here are the societies of the horns. This is Amo. The most sacred thing for me, I think, is when you're making your offering. You know, you have to be truthful. And then the beaver bundle and the medicine pipe bundle. So I think a lot about the kids and... And I think if we help them out, you know, I think their lives will continue like we had, that there is a culture there. It's not lost, like everybody's saying this. Because I think if we try hard enough, we get it all back. <laughs> Unless you go back to the source of not only the person who actually had the experience, but the person who had the right to have the experience. Because so many of these practices had either gender roles or they had hierarchical roles. They had, you had to be of a certain clan to do a certain thing or a certain gender or a certain position. There are many different factors that will will make the information accurate.
<clears throat> so then one of the things that uh, Tom and I did was to interview Bert. Um, and to interview Bert, can uh, I, yeah, can go, I go ahead. Go back to those last. Uh, okay. Yes, sure. Um, yeah, the there's two sets of archives that you're working on. One is the original ones that we got from the Alberta Native Communication Society, which is from 1967 to 1982. Uh, this last ones that we watched were, we have a, uh, a uh, foundation called the Buffalo Spirit uh, Communications Foundation. And we, um, this is where we did a lot of our, our cultural work. Aboriginal Multimedia Society did a lot of our cultural work. So if you see the, uh, if you see the, uh, the, it said Buffalo Spirit Foundation. That's that's yeah. under one of our organizations under the AMSA umbrella or part of the AMSA family. Um, so um, this. Uh, image that you're seeing right now speaking with elders. Um, when I uh, took these photos in my cultural room at, in, beside my office, um, I was watching the smoke and the smoke was telling me to take pictures. And when I looked at the pictures after a while, I started seeing images in there. And if you can see in here, you're seeing a, uh, a, a individual, a person, and you're also, it's like a, sh a shape, shape shifter, shifter. Here's the uh, head, the arm, the legs. Uh, it's like he's running. You can see claws on his, uh, on the feet. And uh, you can see a lot of different things in the smoke. And so uh, that's, when you froze it on there, I'm, I just keep seeing, seeing this, this image. And so that's why I had to comment on it. Um, but, uh, but anyway, the, uh, all of the elders that spoke in that last piece have all, have all passed on. But if you, if, if you listen to them and what they have to say and the messages that they have to say, it's so important, even in today's, today's world and also for future generations. Absolutely. And and Bert, as we've heard, is a, a tremendous photographer. And so there are many images or several images captured with this smoke uh, that are really quite, quite remarkable. Yeah. So, so what Tom and I did um, prior to uh, um, a presentation several months ago, because we weren't sure Bert could make it, is we interviewed Bert and we asked Bert questions about um, tradition, aspects of tradition, particularly to animate some of his photography of powwows and dancers, um, but also for him to talk about dance traditions and his own experience with dance um, just a couple of years ago. So, um, but you want to listen to this first and then... This is uh, during COVID times because you can see my little <laughs> bottle of wet ones. <laughs> COVID had just started. <laughs> All right, so just just a couple of minutes here. Yeah, go ahead. Culture and traditions are is it's alive, it's it's living, and with the access to travel to planes to whatever, you know, like I talked earlier about the sun dances, you know, it's got Sioux influences, right? Same thing with uh, with dance. You've got the jingle dance, which was an Eastern Canadian dance that is now performed all over North America, right? You've got the men's chicken dance, which is a Blackfoot dance that is now performed all over North America. Uh, the men's fancy dance, which is originally from Oklahoma with all the colorful feathers and everything else. Uh, it was coming, I mean, I was involved in that. I used to dance about 100 pounds ago. And I would, uh, I would when I was 20, I started dancing. And my roommates were uh, Tiny Lone Bear, who was a Southern Cheyenne from Oklahoma, and Ray Washburn, who was from, uh, he was a Comanche from uh, Lawton, Oklahoma. And so they taught me. And so I learned how to dance Oklahoma style, which is different than the Northern style, which is a lot slower. 
And so when I moved north in the summer, I started making those hackle bustles. And Small Boys Camp, which is a, a, a camp in the mountains, uh, there were some people who came up from California and they showed them how to make hackle bustles. So at powwows in the early 70s in Canada, you would see the introduction of the fancy dance bustles and half of the bustles at a powwow were made by myself and the other half were made by small boys camp. And so that's how uh, men's fancy dance evolved to up here. And so, uh, so dance is alive and it's changed in the last 10 years. It's going to change again in another 10 years, you know, with the introduction of, uh, you know, ribbon skirts, for example, people have talked about those and people have said that's a traditional thing. And some people say, well, the Hutterites and the, uh, the uh, Ukrainians, but their florals and their colorful uh, uh, stuff. And the, because they were, living side by side, there was kind of a blending and mixing of cultures. So uh, I don't know the full story, uh, you know, I, but I've seen pictures of, of ribbon skirts going back to the 1800s. So who knows? But there is, I mean, culture and language is alive. It's changing, it's evolving. And it's always nice to go back and see what was. And there's a lot of people that are getting into this retrospective type stuff where they're going back and they're copying the old outfits and they're copying the old beadwork and they're starting to do this again. In the old days, we should we used to be able to tell, oh, there's a northern dancer because of the floral type beadwork and there's a plains person because of the geometrics in their beadwork. Nowadays, that's all blended and you don't know. Basically, you can't really tell where they're from. So then Bert allowed us to, uh, Culture and whoops, allowed us to, to uh, show some of his photographs here. If you haven't seen them, they are stunning. Um, and uh, so if you think about what Bert has said and, and what we can do and what uh, communities can do to understand how um, these, uh, uh, this clothing is, is uh, assembled and, and why, there's a huge amount of, uh, of learning, but also preservation and historical access to information that would not otherwise be be available. Both through Bert's, you know, new 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 photographs, um, uh, and through some older Bert. That's you, isn't it, on the left? Yep. <laughs> yep, that's Bert. <laughs> yes, Those legs, the nice legs, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, so historical photographs, even bef even before that, but also for contemporary, the work that Bert is doing as a, a digital storyteller, as he as he calls himself, um, and wonderful to see to see the kids in uh, in various ages as well. This this photo was from nineteen eighty five ish. These guys are all grandfathers now. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so there's another another portion. Bert was talking about the film, some of the video that we've um, digitized that has we haven't matched up the sound and the visuals. Still, a great amount of learning possible from from either side of of those of those archives. And we have um, a, a, a very a, a long excerpt, not not a long one to play, but several long ex excerpts digitized. Um, uh, recording recording events such as powwows or celebrations, not non ceremonial, as 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 Bert said, showing things like the dances, like the the uh, the hand games and the stick games, uh, all kinds of community experiences that were cross community Ukrainian and uh, First Nations. And so the next slide, oh, there's another. There's a chicken society. Uh, so history. Pardon. Prairie Chicken Society. Yeah. Prairie Chicken Society. Um, so we have this silent, silent at the moment, silent because we haven't matched up any audio with it. Um, and so perhaps Bert, if you want to talk a little more about that, I'll I'll play an excerpt from it. Sure. Um, and uh, let me just get to a spot that would be wah. That's from Saddle Lake. That's Saddle Lake. Yeah. 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 We. Um... You digitized one from Enoch, and it was really interesting because I, I think I, it was on TV or, or on the news or something, but I started getting calls from everybody from Enoch. They wanted to see it. 
uh, like I said, a lot of people have passed on. A lot of some of these people were like kids running around and now they're, they're in their forties and fifties. And so it's pretty interesting when people look at this to, to see their reactions, you know, to, to identify people that, you know, that they know, or like even looking into the background, Oh, that's, that's me over there, you know, and it's, it's interesting to see those. And then to, 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 to watch the dances. And as I say, so a lot of these, uh, these kinds of uh, videos that we've digitized or films that we've digitized uh, show communities, we'll see square dancing and it, it, it square dancing or Ukrainian dancing, some with First Nations groups, some with other cultural groups. Uh, and it's, um, how, how can we understand though the, this sort of community event, Bert? How did they come about? Well, this, this was, back then they didn't call them powwows, they called them Indian days. And uh, you can see where uh, they're doing their, uh, their um, clips for when they're going to, like their different segments i'm not a television person so i don't really understand but um yeah just looking at their outfits compared to today's outfits just even their even their dancing styles are uh, are uh, they call this old style now hmm. old, uh, old style uh, uh this is uh, i i think it's women's fancy but it See, uh, so yeah, fancy shawl dance, or one of them was anyway. Well, when, back in the 70s or early 80s, I should say early 80s, um, when you, you see those feathers, those pink, colorful feathers, that's a men's fancy dance bustle. When I first came up here, they put everything together. I, I actually came second in 1974 in the World's Prairie Chicken Dance Championships in Calgary. Uh, finished second to Nick Breaker, but I was wearing that men's fancy outfit. Whereas, if you look at today's chicken dancers, they are very much. There's a very they have a very specific design. But back then, everything was kind of thrown in together. Uh, so it was just we didn't have men's traditional. It was just men's dancing, right? Yeah. And then women's dancing. But in today's powwow, they have all the different categories, seven different categories plus golden age, plus tiny tots and juniors and teens, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's, uh, it's a long event, but back then it was uh, much more of a social, like everybody danced. Uh, and even though I was dressed in a, in a fancy dance from, outfit from Oklahoma, I was at Browning one time dancing and I had this elderly lady tug on my shoulder and she said to me, I really like how you dance. You dance like the old ones. And I took that as a real compliment because I would watch my mentors, Nick Breaker, and how he danced. So I imitated a lot of what he was doing. So I was kind of a, a chicken dancer with, in a men's fancy, dancing some of the steps that my roommates had showed me, which is uh, Southern style um, o Oklahoma um, men's fancy dance. So. Cool. So, uh, something we've we've come across recently that uh, Bert has only listened to yesterday, I think, um, is uh, 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 a program called Native Education. I believe it's uh, an interview with uh, with Eva Cardinal, uh, where she's actually talking about her experiences in residential school at Blue Quill, Blue Quill Indian Residential School. It later, I believe, became Saint Paul's Boarding School. Um, moved from Laklavish to Saint Paul's. And it's about a 30 minute interview um, where she is uh, reminiscing and recalling her early days in the school. And I, and uh, we, we, we talked yesterday, Bert did an interview with, Bert and I did an interview with CKUA. And uh, we thought this might be a good one to include a sort of another thoughtful um, representation or uh, expression of uh, historical documentation that has become uh, more poignant and more, even more important with time. So if, uh, this, this was done about 30 years ago, right? And even, yes. even what she's doing today, yeah. uh, she was talking about how her name, when she went to school, they said, your name is Eva. And, but she, that wasn't her name. She had a Cree name. Yeah. So yeah. That, 
that was the interesting part. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so and so there are there there are, there are many of these interviews that uh, that we're finding in the archive um, and uh, current events talking about constitutional rights and human rights and uh, uh, and so this was just one example and it is the last example I've got to uh, to play a couple of minutes long so this is about eleven minutes into the interview uh, somebody named Brent is interviewing her for the Native Education Program. Any pain from being cut off from your own culture? Or were you cut off from your own culture? Did you feel that you were being cut off from your own culture? You know, as I look back now, I will say yes to an extent. I will say yes to an extent. And yet, on the other hand, uh, not really. Not really. I... uh, Maybe because of the, the, the fact that I didn't have a mother to guide me through the many things that a mother does for her children. And then again, it's very interesting that you would say that, Brent, because, uh, uh, okay, in the school that I was raised in, uh, there was a whole lot of praying. There was a whole lot of praying. And... Uh, I remember, uh, I don't quite know if this would uh, answer your question, Brent, but I like to go back into those uh, times where I thought, in the, in the before, before coming into the school, an example I'd like to give you is that when my father talked to this great spirit he talked to him and talked to him addressed him as Nimantong my great spirit and then going into the school meant I had to address this being this spirit as God and I could never really understand the you know, the difference. Now, culturally speaking, I somehow felt better in the way that my father talked to that, that, that great spirit, whereas I became uptight about having to learn this being God, because now guess what? In the school, I was learning uh, prayers by heart, and seemingly uh, I also had to learn prayers in Latin. Can you really imagine a Cree speaking child going into a school and learning a Latin, which I didn't understand a word of? And uh, anyway, to a certain extent, yes, uh, Brent. I I can say I was cut off, and yet on the other hand, I can also say that I am grateful I had the chance to learn the other the other portion, the other culture, so to speak. Okay, so um, Bert, anything you want to add to that? No, that was a very powerful piece to end on. I think we should open it up to questions. Great. Thank you both. I have a question, um, and I'm trying to figure out how to frame it. Um, I remember last year um, we had a talk uh, by Michael Driscoll and Chelsea Maya and some other folks uh, on the Spoken Web project, and something that they said, uh, I forget if if it was Michael or one of the other presenters, but was talking about how interesting it is to be able to experience an audio recording of, uh, for example, a poet performing their work live and how different that is from reading the text. Mm -hmm. And it just, this project, it just makes me think a lot about that because I know in the kind of Western colonial (laughs) um, sense, there's a a privileging of, of writing things down. Whereas I know that a lot of indigenous communities, of course, are completely the opposite. It's all about uh, the oral communication and the connection to the, to the elders and the person. And so I guess my question is, um, 
I, I'm curious about in so once all of this gets digitized, if you've had conversations about what would be the most appropriate way to present this material. And I realize that like it's it doesn't, you know, the you know, one way to do that is to just put it all up on the internet for public access. But that of course is not the right approach. I understand that. Um, but I do wonder um just being able to hear and see um the individual speaking and and also what what's going on around uh the scene is just really, really powerful. So I'm just curious if you've had any thoughts about exhibiting, you know, may, maybe having a place people could go to see the work mm -hmm. or um uh anyway, yeah, just that's that's my question. Yeah, that actually would follow on in Carl Carl Urian's uh, Carl, hi Carl. Carl's question, what about access? Uh, and so, um, you know, let, I'll let Bert, Bert answer this question. And then I see Oliver's hand, by the way. <laughs> um, when we went, Mary and I went to Australia a couple of Decembers ago to uh, be part of a symposium uh, with other groups doing similar projects, the, the Indigenous people of Australia, South Africa, um, forget some of the other places that were there, but all these different communities basically doing what we're trying to do or to preserve culture, to record language. And, and so to me, it was a real eye opener to know that, that we weren't alone to, to see that what colonizing countries like England and Spain and France and what they did to, in, to indigenous peoples when they, when they settled there, you know, what happened in Canada and the States is very similar to what happened in India and, and, and um, the Philippines, uh, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we're all going through the similar um, uh, ways of looking to preserve culture, culture that was almost lost, languages that were almost lost. And so um, the Australian people have this uh, website uh, platform called Mary. <laughs> What's it called? Rukatu? Rukatu. <laughs> Rukatu. I, I could never pronounce it. And um, what they do is they have various degrees of access. There's public access and there's limited access and then very restricted access. If we had a lot of spiritual, cultural, uh, ceremonial type stuff, we would put that in the restricted access, but we don't have any of that. So, uh, but who knows that, you know, down the road we, we might. And so uh, to set up something like this, I know the Edmonton Public Library has something similar, the same platform, but they spent another $70,000, $80,000 to fine tune it so it does what they want to do. And then they've opened it to other groups who want to be part of it, uh, basically sharing knowledge. And so um, when I showed this film to the people at Enoch, I mean, they were so uh, amazed and grateful that we had this digital copy of something that happened 40 years ago and they were very respectful because they said you know where can we see this and you know they could have said i want it it's ours you had no right you have no rights to it but they didn't they understand that if we didn't go through the whole process of having it digitized they would they would have never seen it they would have even known it existed so they were very respectful and said, we'd like to be able to have access to it and <clears throat> just let us know when you're at that point. So uh, that's, I guess, once we finish digitizing this, we need to find a platform in order to share it. Uh, Indigenous people are always, uh, we're a sharing people, you know, that's our, our way. And so to share this is, um, is what I want to do with, with it. Um, also, we're only one of 13 native uh, communication societies across Canada. They all have archives. They all have these kind of stuff in boxes that are under stairs or in basements or, or whatever. And when it comes to video, there's a timeline where the uh, 
tapes, if they're not converted, then they just deteriorate and we've lost them and or fires or floods or, or whatever. So uh, that's another thing I'd like to do is be able to share what we've done with uh, these other communication societies. And, you know, I've heard stories of uh, other people who have, whose grandfathers have actually went around and interviewed elders. And they've also, um, they had, the first ones were reel to reel, then they converted it to cassette tape. And those cassette tapes have sat in boxes for 30 years. And, and that's the, the other thing that we have to make sure that we do with all of these, uh, these archives is that we have to make sure that it's converted to, to evolving technology, the new technology, if something new comes along, we have to make sure that it's all converted to the new technology. I mean, who knows what a floppy disk is going to, uh, you know, be like all of these files might be floppy disks in 30 years. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I've done a lot of archiving myself and I know that um, the, the ironic thing about the digital world is particularly starting in the 90s with CDs, um, uh, that actually those digital formats are worse <laughs> in terms of um, lifetime, lifespan than the old analog formats. So I think it's, it's, a, it's not only, a, I mean, that's changing. And, and I think solid state drives are a little better, but yeah, it's, it's, it's partly like transferring the data to a digital format, but then also having a a procedure for continuing to do that <laughs> over the years and making sure it gets recycled. So it must be, yeah, I'm sure it's a lot of work. I, I know uh, Oliver has a has a hand up. Hi, thank you. Yeah, what an amazing presentation, honestly, and uh, I love the the combination of the artwork and the photography and the sound and it's just it's such a powerful combination i i i also noticed that you mentioned the buffalo spirit organization uh, bert and and i was curious because i saw the logo and i saw the design and it i wonder if there's a if you could just briefly mention what you know what kind of organization that is and then mary i mean when you engage in research like this, how do, you, how do you create the capacity, the safe space to build out research collaborations that can grow across various organizations like AMSA, which within itself, it sounds like has Buffalo spirit something. So how do you guys create that environment? Um, Buffalo spirit, um foundation was um let's see about 30 years ago i went to a sweat in southern alberta and i went up on a hill and you could see the teepee rings where the blackfoot used to camp and there was a buffalo jump there and so when um so we had this sweat at the bottom of the uh, buffalo jump and you could just feel the the ancestors of you know of what went on and after the sweat i was driving home and i was talking with uh, uh i was talking with some about buffalo spirit was supposed to be the name of a of a newspaper and i said you know i i don't think that's the right venue for I think we need to call this, it was a publication. It's, it's got, but it's gotta be for cultural, spiritual stuff, not, not community news from Manitoba or community news from wherever. And cause we had four or five publications at that time, uh, BC Raven's Eye, Alberta Sweetgrass, Saskatchewan Sage, Ontario Birch Bark. We were looking at a newspaper from Manitoba. We were thinking of calling it Buffalo Spirit. And so that's how that started and how that came about. We put out a couple of publications for, for Buffalo Spirit and it was all these cultural stuff. And we, I went on a road trip and I interviewed the, those three elders that you saw. I started off with Ruth, Ruth Brass at Siksika. I drove through towards BC and I would ask people who would be a good person to interview. And it was just like I was guided to Mary Thomas's house 
And so I visited with her for a day or two. And the next name that was thrown at me was Adam Dick out at Vancouver Island. So I didn't know where I was going. I pull up and I start talking to him. And next thing you know, he adopts me as one of his sons. And, and so um, he uh, is a very, very powerful uh, clan chief. He's, uh, and so that's how, uh, and then we were looking at a lot of, uh, organizations wanted to donate, but they only could donate to a charitable foundation as opposed to a communication society. So we set up Buffalo Spirit uh, Cultural Foundation as a means of providing a, a place where people could donate uh, as, as a charitable uh, organization so that we can continue to do a lot of this cultural, spiritual work that we were doing. And so that's, that's how that came about. The, the logo is actually a buffalo skull that I have on my, uh, on my uh, altar in my, in my culture room. I uh, found it in southern Alberta. And so that's, you know, a lot of the logo design is stuff that I've done. Uh, so. Yeah, and I'm not sure how to how to answer the rest of that question, Oliver, because in in a way, Bert's, Bert's already already answered it. So the the reason for the reach of this project is about those relationships, and about the reciprocity, because this is not research for me. This is experience and relationships, and uh, providing what we can from whatever sources. And I think Bert and I are are a really good team, uh, and I really value working with him. Um, even if he does make fun of me a lot. So <laughs> I'm only, a little serious. He thinks I'm serious. We, you know we, better, Oliver. <laughs> we, we only tease people that we like. <laughs> That's the Indian way, right? <laughs> if, uh, if you're not being teased, then I would start worrying. Okay. Okay, good. I feel good. Then. We're good. We're good. Um, let's see if there's any other hands. Uh, I did see a... Um, uh, a comment from uh, Carl, Carl Urian, um, <clears throat> and I see Mary responded to it, but I want to turn that into a question because I think it's it kind of speaks to what I was talking about before, but um, looking at it from a larger perspective. And the question would be, in trying to think through protocols, um, has there has there been any attempt to bring uh, a kind of, I don't know, um, I want to call it a symposium, but that's not the right word. I'm such an academic, but just you know, some kind of coming together of organizations that are facing similar questions. And uh, so, I'm just wondering if there's been any. I mean, I'm sure there has, but uh, yeah, funny, funny you should ask. <laughs> funny, <laughs> you should, because yeah. So, so um, Bert and I have been involved uh, internationally with with large federal grants, uh, international grants, with this group in. Um, Australia and in Toronto working with South Africa. So we're some of that they've been doing. I was scheduling, I had scheduled an access symposium. Um, I was beginning to schedule for September the 30th and two things happened. I was offered a job in Halifax to start October the 1st and September 30th was, was named as a holiday. This has all happened in the last two months really. And so I've just postponed it because um, I mean, we could be stuck in, in preservation mode for quite a long time, but we all recognize, as Carl does and, and Bert does and the communities do, that we need to get this, um, make, it, make it available. But access is, um, access is complicated and it's a really tricky matter, particularly when, you're think, when you consider the resources needed for storage, the technologies, and the sort of the the uh, the custody of the uh, of the of the materials, so we were putting together a symposium. I was putting together a symposium, and I invited Bert to Lethbridge, and then I left. So we thought we better not do that. So I'm gonna. I'm not sure when I can do it. It's probably looking like what Lethbridge would call spring, but is really dead of winter in Alberta. Um, in order to bring these people together, because we're all struggling with. It's not one protocol, it's many protocols. It's not one kind of access, it's many. And so I want to bring to bring communities together, probably virtually, to, to, to do just that, to talk about how you move it into the next, 
phase and and what's important in doing that and the the group from mukutu which is at university of washington is will definitely be part of that conversation thank you for that so i know uh folks have to go uh i'll maybe i'll just take a moment to ask if there's one final question anybody has okay seeing none um, I'll just mention, um, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank um, Mary and Bert um, for this wonderful presentation and to Tom and Ben as well. And I know there are other people some involved in this too, uh, but this is a really important project and um, it was really great to get such a wonderful update. So let's everybody unmute themselves and, and get... I'd like to... muted myself. <laughs> Can, uh, can I uh, just add something? Yeah, please, please. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in the list of people listening, but my daughter Sandra is was is in our uh, listening tonight, and she's actually taking over our uh, cultural uh, language as well as archives, and we've set up a, a certain area of our building where uh, all of this stuff will be stored, and and some of the future digitization of negatives and, and prints. And uh, so she'll be involved in that. So I'll, uh, so she's, uh, I guess, kind of learning a little bit of how we all got started and where we're headed. And so she'll be an important uh, individual in the future. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming tonight. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks to Sound Studies, to Gail as well, as you, Scott. Thanks, Bert. Thanks, Mary. So good. good to see you. Yeah, you too, Gail. Thank you, Bert. Oh, you're very welcome.